champion is Katie Grimes in swimming. I'm Julie Nichols. My son is Brady Ellison, and he is a four-time Olympian in the sport of archery. My name is Keisha Bishop, and my son is Noah Lyles, who is in track and field. So congratulations to all of you. I don't know what it's like to have an Olympian. <laughs> Most of us probably never will. Um, so Sherry, why don't I start with you? I mean, does this moment feel surreal to you? I haven't even quite wrapped my head around the fact that she's there. And it was it was always been a dream in our house, but we just didn't think it was gonna happen this quick. And I think even for her, she's still having a hard time wrapping her own head around it. Every step as we go through this process, we're like, oh my gosh, she's an Olympian. Katie, who is 15, is the youngest out of all of them. <laughs> and I just had a chance to talk with her. Um, how do you think she's handling all of this? I think she's actually doing a really good job. We do talk to her on a daily basis and she's having a lot of fun. She's sharing oatmeal with Katie Ledecky every morning and she's just, it's just been an unbelievable experience for her. I'm trying to think of what I was doing at 15. I was like trying to get a license. It was like, you know, make running for student council president. Like I just can't even <laughs> remember. So it seems like, um, Julie, you're the pro here amongst all of us. <laughs> Tell us about, about Brady and how this feels for you, even though you've been here before. It's still exciting. So bummed we can't go. And I feel for the families, you know, first time Olympians and you don't get to be there. And you know, that's what we've been doing for the past 16 years. We're so excited for him. You brought up a really good point, Julie, about not being able to be there. It's heartbreaking um, that you, your athletes, you know, most of us that are on this Olympic journey, it's not something that your child has done for six months or a year. It's something that they've done for a while. And you're traveling with them, you know, you're schlepping them all over the country, going to all these different events and everything. And you're you so look forward to it and then COVID happens and they postpone the games and that was hard and you know scrambling to keep our reservations for everywhere our hotel and everything because having done this before we know that you have to find your hotel i mean we get all of our reservations and everything the year before and we just go on faith that brady's going to make the team um and we get all we do everything you know a year in advance so the hotel was great. Um, we were at the Sheraton uh, by Tokyo Disneyland. So we were really looking forward to that. And um, and so they kept our hotel reservations, just moved it, you know, and we were all crossing our fingers. And then when they came out and said no foreign spectators, it was, oh, you know, we were so disappointed. And I just, I feel for all those first time athletes that have worked so hard to get there and their family can't be in the stands, you know, they're, and the parents who have been there through everything, you know, taking them everywhere for this dream and they can't be there. And you can talk to them on the phone, but it's just not the same. And it's just, I just feel for them, you know, even with us being, would have been our fourth ones, it's still heartbreaking to us. Keisha, your son is officially an Olympian. How does it feel for you as a mom, especially knowing all that's happened behind the scenes to get here? Yeah, it is really surreal, which I think is a word a lot of us moms are using. Um, this has been a dream of his and his brothers. His brother didn't make the team, unfortunately, but it's been a since they were in eighth grade. So it's been over 10 years. They've been pursuing it. He made the Olympic trials as a high schooler and just missed the team by one spot. So now we're here five years later and we made the team and it feels like such a weight has fallen off of our shoulders because it's just been something we know we can do, but just executing it is totally different. So it's really exciting and surreal. How does it feel uh, knowing that you won't be able to be there in person? 
You know, I am okay with it. If you had asked me this a year ago, I would have been devastated. But based on everything we've been through in the past year and a half, I am just so excited that we actually get to have the games. Like, I don't care if I have to watch it from my bedroom or wherever. It's like, I just want them to compete safely. And, you know, I don't want anyone to get sick, but I'm still just as excited. Tell me about your the, the training and what goes into it and what pu- people don't see at home as far as how hard your kids work. We're up every morning at 4 a.m. I slept on the back seat of my van um, for mornings for years now as I drop my kids off at the pool and I and I sit in the parking lot at five in the morning for a couple of hours and then you know they're back again in the afternoon. They have weights in between that and that's, you know, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. And um, I I don't even think that my own family quite understood the rigorous workouts and sacrifices that they've made and and what the purpose was for all of that over the last 10 years until this moment. Then they're like, oh, okay, now we see why they're a little crazy with this whole swim stuff. (laughs) Sherry, I am so happy you just mentioned that. There are a lot of moms, including myself and dads, who, you know, I have to take my boys to soccer practice twice a week. And I'm like, (laughs) oh, you just said that you're up at 4 a.m., sometimes six days a week, sleeping in the back of your van while they practice and then coming back and doing it again later in the day. Really? Yes. And for you, Julie, how has it been? growing up with Brady. Brady is my only. He actually moved out to the Olympic Training Center when he was 16. So we we took him and we dropped him off and he was like, bye, see ya, you know. And so he he did online school and um and so that's you know he, he left home and that was that was what he wanted to do. And you know they trained eight hours a day and And now, um, you know, people just don't realize or when he's home in Arizona, you know, they'll like, they want to pull him away. And he's like, you know, I'm I'm training. I, I, this is my job. I have to do this. It's not my hobby. People still think that what he does sometimes is a hobby. We're like, no, it's, it's not a hobby. And he travels over 200 days out of the year. He and his wife for the archery, they travel all over the world to compete. So it's, it's hard. It's, it's a grind. We drove all over the place. You have to drive across country. You're flying everywhere. It, it's just, it's a lot. You know, I think it's important for people to hear all the work so that when they see them, you know, front and center on, a, on an international spotlight, they'll understand what it took to get there. Let's go. This is a critical choke point for this fire. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit PlanYourVaccine.com and make your plan. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Keisha, you ran track too, right? I did. I like to say I ran track BC before children. And (laughs) six pounds lighter. (laughs) So I have a total of seven kids. We're a blended family. I have three biological I just be married a couple of years ago, but uh, so together we have seven. Our youngest is 21, but I think what people don't see is that it is a lifestyle. It's not something that's just a hobby. It's a lifestyle and it becomes a family lifestyle because people have to sacrifice so much, like Sherry was saying, sleeping in the car. And 
um, you know, we have a lot of similar stories, but I think one thing that people don't get is the pressure and the expectations because they only see the excitement. Oh, you've made the Olympic team. This is so exciting. Oh, we see you on TV, you're in a commercial, but the physical, mental, and emotional pressure and expectation can be really difficult to manage. And that's where your team has to come in. You know, it's not just the athlete for us. Noah has a sports psychologist, a family therapist, nutritionist, chiropractor, massage therapist, coach, agent. So yeah, <laughs> so we are a whole team. And then um, whenever we go somewhere, whenever he travels to a big meet, our whole family goes, you know, myself, my husband, his sister, um, his uncle, his grandmother, we really try to support him as much as possible. And after the Olympic trials, I was in bed for a week because I was so exhausted. <laughs> I can only imagine, how do you deal with that, the mental health aspect of it? I mean, he has therapists, he has you know other professionals in his life, but your mom. So the way I deal with it is I make sure I stay in contact with my therapist <laughs> <laughs> so that I can keep my tank filled and overflowing. Because what's in the tank is for me, but what's overflowing is for everyone else. So if I'm not overflowing, I have nothing to offer him. And when we go to the Olympics or the Olympic trials or world championships, we put ourselves in a bubble. We ignore social media we ignore text messages and we just stay focused on the goal at hand and we don't try to get wrapped up in anything else because we're there just to grind it out and, and to meet a goal. And Julie, I read for you that you try not to hover, which would be very difficult, for, I can only imagine. I try not to hover because when Brady first started, I was your helicopter mom that you read all the bad stories about. And he would tell me, mom, you need to go watch the girls go to the other side of the field. You're stressing me out. So now when we go, I'm like, I love you. Good luck. You know, shoot good. And then I usually visit with everybody. I pay attention to what he's doing. You know, we watch everything, but it, it, we've been doing this for a long time now. So I try not to hover because that affects them. This whole Olympic journey is something else. So if I were to ask you, Sherry, what has been the most challenging in this journey and the most rewarding so far, what would you say? Well, the most challenging right now is just not being there with her. Um, you know, I was thinking back the other day, I think that she has been to one meet um, in her lifetime of swimming by herself without a family member. Uh, I mean, we were usually at all the meets and, um, for not this last season, but the season prior, she had her brother on the team with her. So her brother would be with her and she's way wiser beyond her years. She's a pretty grounded little girl. Gosh, there's been so many highs with this whole swimming. I mean, we had four of our, the younger four of our kids were swimmers and, and her two brothers went on to swim collegiately. And I think that one of the highest moments with swimming was to have all three of them together at just a little local June age group meet. Um, they were all swimming that our oldest college swimmer had been come home for the summer and he thought, well, I'll just go with you guys and swim as an exhibition. And it was just the best time as a family having those three together swimming at the same meet because that's never really happened before because of their age difference. And it was just, it was just one of those great moments. And, you know, again, going to Olympic trials with our older son in 2016 and having his two younger siblings there supporting him. And then the tables were turned this time. And our, our son has finished his swimming career collegiately and he was able to come down and now watch the two younger ones at trials. It was just, it was just a full circle moment for us. And it was just really exciting. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Good evening.
landing from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. What are you guys feeding these children? I'm over here. Like, All I do is cook. Not, I like these are not tater tot kids. It is crazy how much I spend cooking in the kitchen. Kate's been homeschooled since kindergarten and all of my kids. She's the youngest of seven. And so I, I feel like that's all I do is cook. Uh, so her being gone... I'm kind of experiencing the empty nest syndrome right now. What's your go-to meal? I feel like they might need calories, huh? Lately, our go-to meal has been chicken, vegetables, on rice. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of that with Katie. But, yeah, it's always been chicken and vegetable and either rice or beans. or. But oatmeal has been a huge staple in our house. I think they eat it twice a day, once at 4.30 in the morning. And then again, when they get back from practice in the morning and yeah, even our kids that go away to college, you think they'd be tired of oatmeal and they're like, I can't wait to come home and have dad's oatmeal. They just <laughs> crave it. <laughs> Man, I want to try that oatmeal. What is there, brown sugar in there or something? Why? Yeah, so he puts chia seeds and all sorts of ground nuts and, and yeah. That's how you know I'm not an Olympian. I'm like, does he put brown sugar? You're like, oh, chia seeds, of yeah. course. <laughs> <laughs> and what about for you, Keisha? Noah lives in Florida and I live in Maryland. Um, he actually signed and went professional as a senior out of high school and moved to Florida and didn't know how to cook. So he has a chef <laughs> that comes wow. in and cooks his meals because he does not know how to cook and he wasn't doing a good job with cooking. So I had to make sure his meals were nutritious. But when he was in high school, we used to go through three gallons of milk a week. I felt like I lived in Costco. Um, because for dessert, his siblings, well, he and his siblings liked um, cereal. So Noah's favorite cereal is Raisin Bran Crunch. And he's still addicted to Raisin Bran Crunch. That's like his dessert. That's exciting for him to get to eat that because it's a little bit sweet. I, say, I can relate to you, Sherry, because I used to homeschool. And I remember those days of homeschooling. And every morning I would start out by giving my kids, I would juice for my kids mm -hmm. and give them like barley juice and all of that. And, and I felt like I lived in the kitchen. So Sherry, I totally get you. <laughs> what is barley juice? <laughs> Carrot juice is really sweet. So you add the barley greens in there and it, it tastes wow. pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. They have a smoothie, power greens, berries. It's to get their greens in them. It's a great way to get a big dosage of greens in their diet. I know. Listen, Sherry, I think we have to connect after I'm this. Saying, yeah. well, this is why I do these things. And, and, you know, and you too, Julie, because we think we know, but we don't, I'm sure. You know, Noah, by the way, I should say, wrote this beautiful letter, uh, Keisha, about you and all you guys have been through. Talk for people who don't know, tell us a little bit about your journey, what you guys have been with. He has asthma. Yeah, we've been through a really rough journey. Thank God we're through that. But um, I have been married to my first husband for 13 years and I had been a stay at home, homeschooling mom during that time. So when I divorced, even though I had a college degree because I attended Seton Hall University on a track scholarship, I did not have the experience to match my age. So I had to start out working at entry level jobs. So I did a lot of case management um, at Title I schools, worked with homeless children, loved my jobs, but they just didn't pay a lot. So there were times when we had our lights turned off and um, unfortunately we had to apply for food stamps. I was so embarrassed, but my daughter, she's so precious. Uh, she said, when we went to apply, she said, mommy, what is this place? And I said, 
well, this is a place you come if you don't have enough food and they help you out. And she thought about it and she said, that is so nice of them. <laughs> So, you know, working full time and still qualifying for food stamps is really embarrassed, but it taught me empathy and that you never know where your journey is going to end up. And thank God it was temporary, but it was it was really in, it was for us. For me, it was very embarrassing and we needed a lot of family support. So we relocated to the Washington, D.C. area. We left Charlotte, North Carolina, moved back to where I was raised and my family helped us out tremendously. And um, eventually we ended up at what was formerly known as T.C. Williams High School. Now it's known as Alexandria City High School. And our community wrapped their arms around us and supported us. And I mean, it's such a team effort. And so that's, we have a nonprofit now supporting other youth through health and wellness. And that's the reason why, because we want to go help other people um, to get to be the best them that they can possibly be, whether it's an athlete or a biochemist, whatever it is to be your best self, we, we want to help you get there. I think Noah did a lot of good by sharing his story because there are a lot of young people who are at home or parents who feel like they don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And he is living proof that not only is there a light at the end of the tunnel, I mean, this kid is on the Olympic stage. What does it feel like for you to see him being open about the challenges, open about mental health and the importance of all of these things. I want people to look at us and say, if they can do it, I can definitely do it because there's nothing special about us, but we just try to pull on all the resources we could get as far as, as family and friends and just our church community. Like we could never be here by ourselves. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Brady now has a wife of his own. You're almost in the next season of it. Talk to me about, about where he is in his life and what he's doing. Brady's doing really well. He, um, he and his wife, Toya, who is also a professional archer, she's from Slovenia. Um, they have uh, a baby. Ty was born in November. So I have my first grandchild. Best thing ever. When he met Toya and they got married, um, he's happy. So when you're happy with your life and, you know, you have to take care of your life first. And if you are happy with where you are in life, then everything else is going to fall into place. Noah is an incredible uh, athlete, but he also has been a very vocal supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement, talking about being a young African-American boy. You know, he's, he's, he's spoken out about that. How was that for you, that season? And it's not over. No, it wasn't over. It was a very very difficult season for us because um, he's very sensitive, Noah is. So seeing a lot of the police brutality that he was seeing was very painful. And he would say, mom, you know, what can I do to make a difference? So we had a lot of conversations about getting your message out there in the appropriate way, because you can say something that people agree with, but that 
if you, but you can also turn them away by your method of communication. So we were really careful to make sure that we communicated effectively because our goal is to unite and not to divide. What do you want people to know about Katie? She's on her own path. Everyone wants to say, well, Katie Ledecky was 15 and Katie Grimes is 15 and, and it's the same race, it's the same story. And I, I have to agree with Keisha on that. That puts a lot of pressure on a 15 year old. I want people to see Katie for Katie Grimes and she's got her own path and not to put such huge expectations on a 15 year old. Let her do her own journey with this. And um, I think that's important for her. And as her village of supporters, it's important for us to remember that as well, that this is, is Katie Grimes's journey. And we love Katie Ledecky's um, sportsmanship her. She has been such a great role model to Katie. She is a class act through and through. Julie, what do you want people to know about Brady? Brady, he is more than this elite athlete. Um, he is more than an Olympian. I think, you know, when I look at Brady, I see what a great human he is, what a great dad he is. Um, and husband and son, he's a humble, good natured human. And we're just so proud of him. That's what people need to remember is, is they're more than what you see on TV. What I'm most proud of is, is the man that he has grown into. Keisha, what do you want people to know um, about your son, about Noah? Track is what Noah does. It's not who he is. He loves his family. He's a homebody. He prefers to be at home than to be out somewhere else. He loves to play board games with his friends on Wednesday nights and just dancing and having a great time. And he has such a teachable spirit. And in teaching him, one of the things that I just told him about the pressure for the Olympics is when we get caught up in the media, it's almost like we're allowing other people to write our story, but we don't allow other people to write our story. We make our narrative and we are, you know, people first and track is just what you do. It's not who you are. Oh, I wish I could give you guys a group hug. I just wanted to say to both of you moms, um, I hope this isn't the end of your journey. I hope that they, you know, like Brady has been doing this forever. If your kids decide that they're going to go for the next one, you know, um, I, I hope that they continue if that's what they want to do and that you continue to enjoy this ride. It's, it's so much fun. Um, and so maybe we'll see each other in Paris. Cheers. I think that is awesome. And I'm just going to try to follow you guys on social media because I know for me personally, this journey gets very lonely. Um, times are hard. You don't have anybody to reach out to because if you reach out to people, they're like, what are you complaining about? You have an Olympian, you have two professional athletes, but people don't get that that's not what's important. It's their soul and guiding their heart. So I'm gonna try to use you guys as some of my resources because it can get really hard. Oh my gosh, you guys are gonna make me tear up and I don't have an Olympian. <laughs> No, but you've got an awesome kid. I do. No, I've got three little ones. And I, I and I seriously, I'm getting teary because, you know, like at the end of the day, while we're busy talking about these Olympians, I just want you guys to know, sitting as a mom on that set, I'm thinking of you guys. And I just want you to know on behalf of all the people who will be watching this story that we see you too, um, from sleeping in your van because you're at practice to cooking all sorts of meals and gallons of milk and <laughs> all of it. I just want you to know that you know, your work obviously wasn't in vain and we know you love your children. And so we just wanted to give you a little bit of love too, as we all look at Tokyo. Thank you. I will be praying for you too, Shanae. Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
is it? Up next on Hashtag Cooking, Sama Dada is taking you on a date with dates. And it'll be hard not to fall in love. First up, she's making the perfect sweet and salty snack, miso almond date bites. Then she's going to whip up a creamy date shake. And then to top it off, a French toast smothered in a gooey date caramel. I do get hangry sometimes, <laughs> shockingly. You would think, because I'm always cooking, I never get hangry. But you know what? It just happens to the best of us. I have been dating for a long time. And no, it's not what you're thinking. I have been eating dates, dates, for a long time. I grew up around them, especially during Ramadan, when we would eat them to break our fast. And since then, I've been absolutely hooked and I hashtag cannot stop dating. I want you to be just as obsessed with dating as I am, so I'm gonna show you three of my favorite recipes. First up, we've got my miso almond date bites, which are salty and sweet. Then I'm gonna show you how to make my super simple vegan date shake. And finally, we're gonna make my favorite French toast with an almond butter date caramel. When you're shopping for dates, let me tell you something important. Make sure you're looking for the medjool variety. These are a lot sweeter and chewier than their other counterparts, which tend to be a bit drier and not as great to bake with, or cook with, or eat as a snack. I like to eat these plain as well, which is why I look for a nice, delicious, chewy, sweet medjool date, because you want something that's a nice, sweet snack, but you don't want anything that's dry. These miso almond crunch bites have everything going for them. They've got some umami from the miso, some crunch from the almonds. They're the perfect snack to keep in the fridge for when you want something a little sweet, but you still want to eat something wholesome. I'm putting in a solid amount because I love a date. These are going to act as a really nice base, a really sweet and chewy base. It's going to allow these bites to stick together, and we're not going to add any other sugar. That's way too many, but I don't care. So I got my dates in my blender, and now I'm gonna add my almonds. I'm using just raw almonds here. These are gonna add the nice crunch to these bites. We love a lot of texture here. Now, to seal the deal, to seal those almonds in, I'm gonna add a little bit of almond butter. You can feel free to use the peanut butter or cashew butter. If you have any other butter in your pantry, feel free to use it. The almonds and the almond butter make this snack super wholesome and delicious. Now, we're gonna add some shredded coconut. Make sure you use the unsweetened variety here because the dates are already gonna add a lot of sweetness to the snack. So pretty. We're gonna add a little vanilla extract, just for a little vanilla. And finally, I'm gonna add some white miso paste. This is made from fermented soybeans and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about miso soup. Stop that train of thought. Halt it right there. This is just gonna add some nice umami flavor and balance out that really nice sweet date and almond combination. Gonna finish this off with a little pinch of salt just to bring everything together. Pull out that sweetness. Little pinch, not too much. And then we're ready to blend. Are you ready? I'm ready. Feel free to scrape down the sides if you need to. I need to. just to get everything nicely incorporated. What you're looking for with this dough is to have some nice texture. So we don't need everything to be completely pulverized. Totally fine if we have some little bigger or smaller pieces of almonds. That's just gonna really contribute to the crunch. This is what we're looking for. As you can see, it's a bit thick, it's a bit sticky. This is gonna be great because it's gonna help us form it into our little bites. I wish you could smell this. It's like warm and salty and sweet, and I haven't even tasted it yet. Hmm, okay. I'm using a really cute cookie scoop here. We want it to be just shy of about a size of a golf ball, but you can make them bigger or smaller if you'd like. I like a little bite-sized bite I can just grab from the fridge when I want something a little sweet and salty. As you can see, this is what we're looking for. You can see a little piece of date here. You've got some different sizes of almond pieces. This is good. We like this. We like texture. It's a work of art. We love this bite. Look at how cute. First one done. My biggest struggle with no-bake recipes like this one is that it really is a challenge <laughs> to get everything to the parchment paper uh, before I eat it all. But I'm doing okay so far. I did sneak a little bite, though. Don't tell anyone. The dates make it really nice and sticky to form into a little ball as well, which is really great. They add a little sweetness, 
they allow it to adhere together. See, this is why I love dating. Look at that, super cute. I always have this in my fridge or freezer because I'm always a little hungry. <laughs> I always like to snack, so this is really nice to know. I feel secure when I have this in my freezer or fridge. We're almost at the end. There's a light at the end of this blender tunnel. Pretty good. Just rolled out all of my dough into these cute little bites. And now I'm just gonna let them nap in the fridge for a little bit just to firm up while I melt my chocolate. Look at that. My little date bites have woken up from their nap in the fridge, and I think it's time to add some chocolate. I've melted my chocolate already, as you know. And now I'm just gonna do a really nice, cute drizzle. If you want a little more chocolate, if you want a little desserty vibe, feel free to completely submerge them. I'm just gonna do a nice little drizzle here. Look how smooth and melty that chocolate is. Look at that. All right, I'm gonna start drizzling. You don't need too much on your spoon. Go a little light-handed so you can get a nice, cute, delicate drizzle. Or you can go full force, do a really heavy drizzle. Whatever is up to you. The reason I like melting chocolate with coconut oil is that it makes the chocolate really smooth and nice, really drizzleable. Drizzleable. I just make up words, honestly, at this point. Got my own dictionary, drizzleable. Makes it easier to drizzle. Feeling like you want more of a chocolate moment, feel free to completely submerge. Take them for a swim. I will not judge you. In fact, I'll support you all the way. If you're getting fancy, you can even do a little crisscross action like this. I mean, come on. Picasso calls. He wants his date balls back. All right, last one. They look so cute. And now I have one final little step. Just gonna add a little flaky sea salt on top. It's gonna bring out that chocolate. It's gonna balance out the sweetness. I love using flaky sea salt over my entire life. You ready? It's a little. It also looks really pretty too. Those big chunks of flaked salt. So pretty, it's so fancy. These bites are gonna take another little nap in the fridge for about 30 minutes. I want this chocolate to firm up and then we'll be ready to eat. What a successful nap. I mean, look at this, so pretty. You've got that nice chocolate drizzle, a little salty contrast. You know what? I should probably take a picture of them before I dig in, so I'm gonna do that. They look too cute not to. Just straight on the tray. Real life action, you know? I've gotta commend my own drizzling skills. I, I just have to have a moment for myself. Okay. I think I'm ready to taste. You know, I thought I was gonna plate them. I had this already, but I'm just gonna eat them straight from the tray because I can't wait. I just can't wait. Okay, here I go. Mmm. <laughs> Look at that little almond piece in there. So sweet. The dates, <laughs> simply in my teeth. The dates are so nicely sweet. The almonds add substance, a little crunch. That chocolate on top just seals everything together. And the salt brings all of the flavors out. And that miso, and gives this sort of savory undertone. There's a little salt, just trying to pick up the salt. No salt left behind, you know what I'm saying? Mm. These are so good. You guys have to try these. You guys have to try these. <laughs> Little crunch. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, have I convinced you to eat more dates yet? 
No? Okay, that's kind of crazy. Well, challenge accepted. I'm gonna go grab the ingredients for my irresistible date shake and show you how it's done. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Not to brag or anything, but there are a lot of date farms in my home of Southern California. And with the date farms comes date shakes. I wanted to make a super creamy and delicious date shake, but without any of the dairy. But shh, don't tell anyone. They'll never know. Okay, I've got to preface this recipe by telling you something. It is so easy to make, you'll never believe it. I'm just gonna add all of my ingredients into my blender and it does all the work for me. I've got my dates here. They're pitted, don't leave any pits in there. That may not end well for you. Adding them straight into my blender. To make that super creamy milkshake vibe, I am using frozen bananas. This is a great way to rescue any of your ripe or nearly perished bananas that have just kind of been sitting on your counter for a while. Freeze them, make banana bread with them, make this date shake, super versatile. Also, when you're freezing your bananas, make sure to just cut them up into cute little slices like this. It'll make it a lot easier to blend. I like the nice little ice cream vibe that these bananas will give the state shake. Super good and flavorful. And the bananas add even more natural sweetness. In we go. A couple more things I'm adding. Some vanilla extract. And because I really want to feel hugged by this date shake, I'm going to add cinnamon because we all know cinnamon is like a hug in spice form. You know? Do you agree with me? I agree with me. Adding my cinnamon. Perfect. Now to blend everything together, I'm going to use some unsweetened almond milk. You can totally use another non-dairy milk option. An oat milk or a coconut would be really nice here as well. Adding my almond milk into my blender. Beautiful. Now all we do is blend. Wasn't that so easy? It's kind of crazy. I shouldn't have, but I did. Here we go. Prepare yourselves. I'm really excited. I think we're done. Now all I'm going to do, pour it into my glass and enjoy. Hmm, okay. I mean, look how creamy that is. <gasps> that was it. That was our recipe. I need to send a picture to my parents. They're still in Southern California. They'll be really jealous. Okay.
Okay, perfect. Now I get to drink it. So thick. It's too good. It's crazy that this is a plant-based milkshake. It's so creamy. It's so velvety, but there's no milk in it. We love a vegan date shake vibe. So good. Mmm. It's cute. It's so good. I could eat this forever. Eat it, drink it. I could drink it forever. My final recipe that really celebrates the magic of dates is an almond butter date caramel that you will want to put over your entire life, but we're just gonna put it on some French toast. I'm gonna go clean my blender and get the ingredients. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're gonna do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them, doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I can track this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. In college at Berkeley, whenever I went to breakfast with my friends, they would always go for the eggs benedict, the veggie omelets, but for me, I only had eyes for the French toast. There was a restaurant pretty close to campus called La Note that had one of the best French toasts I've ever had. It had a really nice and sweet, crisp exterior, and I knew I wanted to replicate something just like that in my own kitchen, but with a twist. So, inspired by the French toast of my dreams, we are gonna be making a French toast with an almond butter date caramel. We're gonna start by making an almond butter date caramel that is so luscious you will wanna drown your entire life in it. But today we're just gonna put it on some French toast. Let's start. Added some dates in my blender. We're gonna add a little bit of almond butter. The almond butter is gonna balance out the sweetness of the dates really nicely. To sweeten this up a little further and to add a little bit more of that caramel undertone, we're gonna add some coconut sugar. To make a super luscious and velvety caramel, we're gonna add some vanilla almond milk. I'm using vanilla here, but if you don't have a vanilla, if you just have an unsweetened, you can add a little touch of vanilla extract. My blender is truly my kitchen BFF, so now all we're gonna do is blend it right up. And caramel will await us on the other end of this. I think we're looking good. Look at how luscious that is. 
And of course, a traditional caramel is made by heating sugar up on a stove, but this is my version of a caramel that uses dates. Now you can see why I want to put this over my entire life. Our almond butter date caramel is ready. All it needs now is some French toast, so I'm gonna go grab the ingredients to make it. Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. There you go. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. It's time to make our French toast. I've got all of the usual suspects here my eggs, my cinnamon, my vanilla extract, and I also have some milk. I'm using almond milk here, but you can use your favorite. Gonna crack two of my eggs into my beautiful little pie dish here. Cute. Perfect. I'm gonna whisk my eggs together until you don't see any separation between the yolks and the white. I'm really putting my entire body into this. <laughs> Whisking eggs, morning workout, perfect. French toast, workout of your day, okay. I'm on board. Okay. This looks nice and smooth. Now I'm gonna add some of my almond milk. Vanilla extract. Vanilla extract for me is a must when I'm making French toast. I just love that little extra sweetness, that little essence it really brings it to life. Little pinch of cinnamon now. We want this to be super smooth, super uniform. It's gonna be a nice little bath for our slices of bread. Okay. I'm gonna add a little coconut oil to my pan, let it melt, and then that's gonna be perfect for me to fry the bread in. Time to dredge our slices of bread in my little mixture here. I'm using sourdough bread here because I love that tangy taste. It's my favorite kind of bread. We're gonna let the bread really soak up that egg mixture. And by the way, French toast is a great use for your stale bread. So if you got any stale bread in your pantry, it's time to make some French toast. I'm gonna flip this over. Make sure it really soaks up all of that goodness. It smells really good already. I know it's crazy because we haven't even cooked it. One last step before I cook my French toast. I'm gonna add a little sprinkle of coconut sugar on both sides because I want that really sweet crispness on the exterior. Mm. 
Look at that. It's gonna get some nice color as well. Now we're going straight to my pan. Hmm. You know what? No, or I'm adding a little extra sugar on top. So we want to cook these until they're nice and cooked through, golden brown on both sides, about three to five minutes per side. This is a great brunch recipe, a great breakfast recipe, and honestly, a great dinner recipe too. Like, who are we kidding? We can have French toast for dinner. There are no rules. I like pan frying these in coconut oil as well because I think it plays really nicely with that coconut sugar. All right, we are going to flip. You know, I consider myself a patient person, but then when I'm cooking French toast, I'm like, hurry up. Can't wait all day. It's not even that long. I don't know why I'm being so dramatic. Just gonna flip my second piece. Look at that color, looking so golden. Ready for a photo, ready for some caramel, some date caramel. All right, these are looking beautiful. I'm gonna transfer them to my plate. So I'm hungry. Do we think they're ready for their caramel? I think they're ready. All right. It's thick, it's luscious. I'm gonna be generous here. Nothing wrong with a little thick drizzle. I'm gonna dip in for some more. I really just went for it. I was trying to be delicate before and now I'm just straight up going for it. I like having a little pool of caramel on the side. It looks really delicious. I'm gonna add some berries just to sidle up next to that date caramel, sit on top of it. They kind of stick nicely onto that caramel too. A little powdered sugar. You can't tell me you don't want this. You just can't tell me you don't want it. It looks so pretty. I think La Note would be proud. I should probably send them a picture. Maybe I'll slide into their DMs. <laughs> oh, it looks so pretty. The almond butter caramel, while delicious, it is a brown color and so is bread. So by adding pops of color like these berries, that powdered sugar, just really brings all of those colors and flavors to life. I'm going in. I'm immediately overwhelmed, so I don't know where to go. <laughs> okay, okay, here we go. We're going for it. Gonna get a nice little crust. Add a berry. Okay, bon appetit. It's, I need a minute. That date caramel is like the best sub for a maple syrup. It's so much more flavorful, more complex. Those dates and the coconut sugar create this really nice, marriage of sweetness. I love using sourdough here too because it's sour, it's kind of tart. Because it's so fermented, it goes so well with the sweetness of the caramel. The berries really make everything pop. I mean, I'm not trying to have like a French toast off with La Note, but I don't know. I think I might, I think I might. And don't get me wrong, I love maple syrup. Sometimes we like switching it up. I love snacking on dates. They're my favorite thing ever. But this almond butter date caramel really shows how many things dates can do. We just love to date dates. They can do it all. We're back. I'm Anthony Contrino, and it is time to get saucy. We've got a brand new kitchen and new episodes coming your way this summer. Tune in to Today All Day, Mondays at 11 a.m.
Yule, thank you so much. Yeah, this is you. a really exciting time, but it's like, it's been a crazy year, yeah. right? Like oh, yeah. 2020 was nuts. Yeah. Um, just can you talk about like what kind of challenges you had to balance in order to get the training that you need to compete in the Olympics with everything going on? Yeah, so from the start actually in March when everything shut down, you know, you're three months away from Olympic trials. So it's really like what we're feeling now, but you know, it got shut down and then you kind of have to take like a mental break and think like, what's next? How am I gonna prepare for a whole nother year? Because 360 days is a long time yeah. of going in every single day, training six hours a day. So for me, I really had to take a mental break and we found out that all the gyms were closed. So the next step that I took is I, you know, called Mark Williams, the OU coach at the time, um, you know, can I get a horse in my garage? And for about three months, you know, I had a horse. I went to Home Depot and I bought eye hooks and drilled them into my ceiling and, and got these Amazon rings and did ring strength. And then I actually got air track to send me a mat so I could tumble. So, you know- All for, in your home or outside All in your my home. home. You know, every day we'd blow up the air mattress, do tumbling, you know, deflate, put it back in the garage. So, it, and it was hard because some days it would be raining. Some days it would be really cold. So you would be in your garage freezing. I remember we bought space heaters just to warm it up just so we could get something productive done because gymnastics you know you take one day off it takes two days to come back yeah you know yeah you, you have to compete almost on a daily basis how like did do you feel like it took a step off of your game are you worried that you lost something in all you had to do to try to get back in the beginning yes yeah. uh, definitely you know you're not going into the gym you're not getting coached you know this is all self-workouts at the home and, you know, when I finally got into a gym in Oklahoma, it was an hour drive there, hour drive back during rush hour time. So it was, it was awful, honestly. You know, it was probably some of the hardest training months of my life because I knew that's what it was going to take. You know, it was going to take seven hours a day of training and feeling like you can't get up the next morning. And when I finally felt good and felt like my strength was back, I just remember Literally a month ago, I was just thinking about this. I was thinking like, wow, like I can't believe that I'm like finally here and that I'm feeling good. You grew up in Colorado. Oh, what yeah. was what was the experience like of just being a kid here and, and you know, training here, but also just, just, you know, being a person in Colorado? Growing up, I feel like Colorado just had everything that I needed to, you know, build the puzzle of my life of, you know, helping me in my journey of gymnastics, my school, you know, my social life, you know, and the car scene here is great. <laughs> <laughs> the car scene, you're yeah. big into that. Yeah. What about more specifically growing up on a farm? That's yeah. an experience a lot of people don't have. What, what, what do you think that was like and what did it teach you? Oh, so many lessons. You know, growing up on a farm at a, as a kid, you don't know anything else. You know, you don't really know the city. You don't know public schools. So for me, I just thought that, you know, this was my house, you know, I've got a bunch of land to ride my bike and play with my Legos on and, you know, just mess around. And I remember, you know, doing the chores, you know, you had to do them. It's not like you could just take one day off else then your animals don't get fed. And, but it just teaches you so many responsibilities and it teaches you, you know, how to kind of work as a team. You know, our family had to do stuff together, you know, and so it kind of teaches you teamwork, you know, again, responsibility. The diligence, the hard work, the waking up early, the routines. Yeah. Do you think it's prepared you for a life of competition as well? Oh yeah, and actually, you know, the routine part is a huge part. You know, every day, wake up, feed the animals, get your homework done, you know, go outside and help, you know, whatever job we have, you know, the irrigation or something like that. So definitely the routine part helped me because when I get to a gym, it doesn't feel anything different than if I'm at home. Yeah. And I think that's helped me my entire career yeah. is just having a routine and understanding that, you know, that job has to get done that day in order to, you know, get ready for the next day. Yeah. And in family life, how was that? Your sisters, your brother, were they encouraging early on when, when you were showing like an aptitude in gymnastics? Oh yeah. And my family has been way more supportive than I think any other family would, you know, as you know, kids, you know, you have the fights, but you also have that love for each other. And I remember, you know, just moving to Denver, my family had to make a huge sacrifice. They had to switch schools, switch, you know, friends, kind of be on the same schedule as I am because, you know, none of us could drive. So my mom would have to pack us all in the car, 
take me and my brother to the gym, drop my sisters off at school, come pick me and my brother back up, you know, feed us, you know, go home, drop us off, run back to school, pick up my sisters, you know, take my sister to rock climbing class or my sister to, you know, a musical class and then pick up my brother and I feed us. So it was a routine. And then, you know, my dad would, you know, have, have to be the one to go to every travel meet and, you know, get the hotel ready, get the rental car, make sure the hotel had a kitchen or we bring like a little stove because we're gluten free. And, you know, that was part of, you know, my nutrition was not eating wheat, you know, because my family was allergic, you know, I was probably allergic. So there were just so many extra things that my family had to do for me, for meets, practice, school. So, you know, I, I can't think of enough. Yeah. Oh, uh, what does it mean to you that they were there for everything? And you said your dad, you said you brought a stove, like a little stove? Yeah, just, you know, sometimes like a camping stove. Wow. And yeah. he'd make me food on there because, you know, we'd have to go to a store. We couldn't go out and eat. You know, there's wheat and everything now, or at the time there was. But what does his time with you mean? Oh, everything. You know, it, I can hear his voice when he's cheering for me. So. It's okay. Honestly, though, this family, knowing that I've been adopted, it's just like, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't want another family at all. Like, this family is perfect for my journey and who I am. Were there difficult discussions when you were a kid about your background, how much did they explain to you about where you came from and your mom? And you know, they were so open about yeah. it. And, you know, I think they just wanted me to understand as soon as I could understand that I was adopted. But, you know, I don't look at it as like an adoption. You know, I look at it as like a second chance and they have been very open about it. They haven't tried to hide anything. And they just wanted me to understand, you know, the life that I'm in because it's an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity just to come from, you know, South Korea where my life could have been not the same at all, not even close. And to come to the U.S. to have a family so open about, you know, just a kid trying to chase his dreams, it's, it's meant the world to me. And to, to know that my parents have my back and my family has my back and that they're supportive and that they're open, you know, that's hard to find. Was, was there any difficulty in the fact that, you know, your family looks white, you look Asian? Was, there, was it tough at school at all to deal with that? What, what kind of difficulties arose from that? You know, honestly, the, the only times that I felt uncomfortable <laughs> is when I was a kid, because I viewed my mom, dad, you know, we're the same. I yeah. don't care if I'm tanner or if I have black hair, you know, these <laughs> are my parents. The only t thing that would bother me a little bit when I was a kid is, Sometimes at the cash register, you know, the lady would be like, is he yours? And I would wonder, why is she asking that? But, you know, as I grew up, I understand it. It, it probably wasn't out of, you know, hate or anything. You sure. know, it was just a curious question. But, you know, I've never had a problem. You know, maybe just being Asian, yeah, there are other things that come with that. But being adopted, never. Yeah. Speaking of that, I know you had an incident not too long ago. <laughs> yeah. Take me back to that day, where you were, what you were doing, yeah, so uh, and how it affected you. It was actually, you know, a couple or maybe a few months ago. Yeah. Um, I was driving on Wadsworth, just coming home after morning practice. And this lady, you know, wanted to get in my lane. So I honked the horn and at the red light, you know, she rolled down your window and she said, go back to China. And at the time, I was just so confused. And I was just like, for me, I was just like, lady, if you knew my job every day to work hard so I can represent this country, it's just like shocking to me that she didn't even know who I was or what I do for this country. And for her to say that because of what I look like, it's just, it, it was frustrating because if people were just a little more educated, if people just didn't speak out of, you know, hate and actually just like thought about what they were going to say, you know, we wouldn't have to go through these awkward, you know, uncomfortable times. Yeah. Does it make it harder to think that 
you know, I have to, I'm doing it for this lady too. I'm doing it for everybody. How much more difficult does it, does it give you a sense of bitterness at all, knowing that you're training to represent the United States and there's all this hate in the country right now? It, it is uncomfortable, you know, knowing that there are people like that that you do have to represent because, you know, when we went to international meets, you get in the taxi and they would just be like, oh, America's so bad, like, you guys don't do right. And it just sucks because there are so many great people here too, though. And that's what makes my job easy is I'm not representing, you know, those kind of people. I'm representing the good people, you know, the good hearted people, my friends, my family, my coaches, you know, everyone that's just a positive person. And that I think outweighs the negatives. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Your parents, I think, described you almost as like aggressively positive, like this, <laughs> like, like super ball of positive energy. How do you keep that up? I mean, and do you think that that helps you be a better competitor? Where does that come from? It's just so I I like to reflect on my life, you know, at times a lot throughout the year and. For me, I have nothing to be negative about. You know, I'm from the day one, I've been given a life that is so meaningful and I'm so blessed to be. And then I have friends, I have family, I'm, I have a roof over my head, I'm never hungry. And when you can take that aspect of life and really understand that I have the things that are making me happy, I feel like there's nothing to worry about. You know, yes, you'll need money, you'll need a job, but that that shouldn't be your number one priority. It should be being happy, living your day like it's your last, honestly. You just never know. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, but I imagine part of that outlook comes from your parents and your, oh, yeah. your, your dad. Like, is, was he like a typical gym dad? No. No, not at no, all? No, not at all. You know, all, the gymnastics world, you know, parents, they push their kids a yeah. lot, a lot, a lot. My dad and my mom, you know, they just said, make sure you're you're happy, you're having fun. You know, of course, there are some times where they do step in as a parent, do we need to move gyms? Are you happy with this coach? And those are good questions. It's never make sure you get first, make sure you make this, make sure you get this at stage. So for me, this was my sport. You know, this was what I chose. It wasn't them, it wasn't them pushing me. It was just like, do you still love gymnastics? Yes. Do you still love gymnastics? Yes. And they ask me that all the time. Do you still love gymnastics? I say yes, because their influence has been so easygoing. You know, I, I see parents all the time push and push. I'm like, ah, just relax a little bit. Like you have to let this kid be on his own journey. And I, and I think they did that perfectly, yeah. you know, better than any parent could. Yeah. I think your dad was telling us like how coachable you are, how, how well you take instruction, how well you're able to challenge yourself and, and really like, you know, turn up for big events. Where does that come from? But also like, Take me to the process of an athlete on your level challenging themselves and, and like what what is your mental like to be able to compete at a level yeah. like this? This is insane. So for me, going into a competition, just for example, I don't go into it thinking I have a competition. 
not one bit. I honestly go in thinking this is show. This is a show time. This is an episode, episode one, two or three, you, you name it. But for me, it's like we've worked so hard in the gym and you get to go out in front of thousands of people. Why not have fun? Why not enjoy it and make it a show? Like this is your time. This is Team USA's time to really show what we have. And I think when you can look at it in that perspective, instead of thinking, oh, they're judges, it's competition, I need to do well. You know, because that adds stress. And when you can look at it, it's a fun factor. You know, there's going to be so many people there that I get to perform in front of. There's these judges that have been watching me. Let's see if I've improved. Let's see if I can prove to them that I've been taking their corrections. And, you know, that's just helped me get through competitions. But, you know, I learned this at OU. Embrace the grind. If you had to ask Vlad or your parents, your dad, your mom, your sisters, your brothers, if it's more natural talent or if it's more hard work, how would they describe you? Or is that like a bad question to ask in general? I mean, I know it's a combination of yeah. both, but do you, do you feel like you've pulled more from one pool or the other? You know, I, I, I don't know what they would say yeah. because, you know, a lot of people do say I'm talented, but I also try and make sure that I put in the work so people don't just say, oh, he's talented. Like, I want people to know that Yule might be talented, but he also works hard. And I think that is way better sounding than just saying, oh, Yule's talented, mm -hmm. than if you said, yeah, Yule's hardworking. That is a different perspective. You know, I don't know what they say would say, but, you know, Irina was just joking with me the other day, and I was doing these shoulder exercises, and my shoulder was not flexible, and she just kind of joked. She's like, I don't know how you are a gymnast. <laughs> and so it's just kind of like, it's, it's funny because you kind of get to see both sides of, you know, working hard and then you get to see, you know, all these young kids in the gym that are just talented, but they work so hard. So I think maybe a little bit of both, you know, it is kind of a tough question. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring is from, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. <laughs> Celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! Good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. You're already a champion, NCAA, U.S. World. Like, do, do these things enter into your preparation for, for being a, an Olympian? I mean, and does, does your thought process change knowing that this is the biggest stage possible? For me, I'm ready. Like, I have dreamed about this for so long. You know, I feel like I was so close in 2016 when I was, you know, young, going to trials, got fifth, you know, did pretty well. And I got a little bit of taste of what it'd be at like to be at the Olympics, but, you know, going through the NCAA, it prepped me just to know like what I need to think about at a meet for that day. And then going to Worlds, you know, that just brings a whole different experience. You get to see the best gymnasts in the world all on the same floor. And for me, that's exciting because I got to watch these guys on YouTube, 
TV. And I was like, I want to be there one day. And now that I'm finally here, it's not, yay, I'm here, I'm relaxed. It's like, it's go time. Like, this is like what I've been working for. I want to show people like who I am. And, you know, a lot of people might get nervous because, oh, it's your first world. It might be your first Olympics. You know, you only get one try in four years, but you got to forget about all that <laughs> stuff. You can't, you can't be thinking about that stuff. You know, this is, you here, you made it. You you got to where you wanted to be. So why stress on something that doesn't even, you know, matter? Those are just words. What you can control is your body, your job, your gymnastics. So, you know, yes, it does help. But, you know, I remember my first worlds and a lot of people say, you're going to get nervous. There's a lot of people there. You know, it's going to feel a lot different. And I just remember going in there and I looked at the crowd and I was like, I have been dreaming of this moment my entire life. I've wanted to compete in front of you know, not just 10,000 people, but, you know, 30 to 60,000 people. And that is like, yes, I finally get to feel like what a football <laughs> player feels, you know? So for me, it's it's like these dreams are coming together finally. And it's like these dreams are becoming a reality. So it, for me, I don't try and think about, you know, it's my first one or you only get one try in four years. You know, no, this is, this is, this is the time. This is your dream. Let's go. You love this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, sports in general, it's all about who, who's mentally toughest. Yeah. You know, think about football. Everyone gets, you know, pretty strong, almost the same speed. Yeah, you know, you can throw a football, catch it, but it's, it's what you're going to tell yourself before entering the game. What are your Olympic aspirations? What do you think? How far do you think you can go? So for me, I want to go to at least three or four Olympics. I definitely want to go tell... 2028 because that is in Los Angeles and I think it'd be pretty cool to say you got to retire in the U.S. but you know my number one goal is to win an Olympic medal as a team because there's no greater feeling than looking to your left to your right and looking at your teammates and knowing like we just did something special together not individually but together you know individual I know if I do well as a team you know, those individual awards will come. You know, of course I want to get an all around and some individual events, but my priority is for the team because that is, it is amazing feeling winning as a team. Do you think you guys can get a medal this year? And do you listen to the analysts? Do you listen to people that tell you what your chances are and all of that, or you do tune in all of that out? You know, I, I do read it, I do pay attention, yeah. but to me it's just funny because gymnastics is a sport where anything can happen yeah. you have to fight from your first routine on the first event no matter how well you do in between or on the first event till your last event because gymnastics is one of those sports that literally anything can happen and i remember you know an american cup in 2019 i think i was in i was like behind like the whole entire meet but i told myself i'm going to army crawl till the last event i know that i can hit all these events, I just got to do them well and keep crawling. And I remember I won that meet by half of a half a tenth. And it went down to the last routine. And that's part of the sport is anything can happen. So you can hear all these people say, you don't have a chance, whatever. You can hear people say, oh, you had a bad first podium day. But what matters is on that day at that moment, and you fight till the very last end. Tell me about dad to Vlad. And you're, you're training with him and, oh, and yeah. your time with that family and, and watching his son compete. Oh, yeah. I mean, Vladimir is, he's, he's another father to me. And his wife is like a mother to me. Like, it is crazy how much they do for me. Like, Arena, she meal preps for me. She brings wow. me tea every morning. She brings me a boiled egg. She brings me, you know, a bag of vegetables, a bag of fruit. And it's like the best fruit I've ever tasted. It's definitely from... <laughs> you know, whole fruits or sprouts. So it's just like fresh and, you know, it's, you know, she doesn't do that because I asked, she does it because she wants me to feel good. And then they, you know, massage me or, you know, they'll contact someone that they know to get me cupped or something like that. But Vladimir is, he's a dad because he's not just a coach, but because he teaches you so many things that you take with you besides being a gymnast, you know, the discipline, being a good person being respectful, you know, being a man, being a gentleman. You know, Vladimir doesn't want to work with people who aren't kind. You know, he wants 
his gymnast to be known as kind first and then a gymnast. And I think that is just an amazing view as a coach because you're not just teaching these guys skills and gymnastics in their sport. You're teaching them, you know, how to become a young adult, how to prepare yourself for the world, how to treat others, how to be respected. So that is just one of the most amazing aspects of Vlad. And, you know, Sasha, you know, he's like a brother to me. You know, I, I literally walked into this gym uh, to him preparing for worlds, you know, and then I got to see him grow into the Olympic journey. And that was just so eye opening. And I got to see him struggle. I got to see him, you know, on his highs and lows. But I remember watching him at the Olympics doing the horse set. Last up, they needed a hit to win a medal. And he destroyed the set. Like he killed it. I remember jumping up and down on my couch, crying just of joy because I got to see first person of his training and how hard it was to like how many routines he did, how many things he had to push through, you know, the cuts on his wrist, the ribs, the soreness, the tiredness, the coming in alone before everyone and just this whole process that he went through, I got to see it. And I think that's why I had so much emotion because, you know, when you see a good set, you cheer loud, but for me to cry at 10, you know, I just remember I was like, holy cow, like he, he did it. He worked so hard and it, it finally paid off. So that was just an experience I'll never forget. Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope, the COVID vaccines. I know, I know, it's been a little confusing. Like really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Does it ever dawn on you the fact that like kids are going to watch you and think the same thing and follow your journey and be inspired by you? I mean, potentially millions of people are gonna be watching you. I honestly haven't thought no. about it yet, <laughs> but you know. The way I look at it is I'm in this gym and, you know, yes, I can tell that, you know, kids watch me or they want to come up and ask me questions. And, you know, I just look at it as, you know what, they're watching me. They're coming out of their way to ask me something. I'm going to go out of my way to help them too. You know, I'm not some superstar. I'm not anyone different from you. Like, we're all just gymnasts here trying to be the best we can. And I think I try and give that to the other kids because, you know, I could you know, be cocky. I could not talk to them, but I, I know that that's not what a good person does. So I want to give my time back to them as well. Uh, what do you want to do though after all this is done? So for me, I really want to open up like a fitness center, like not just gymnastics, but like where people can come to me and get fit, you know, because I, I want to, you know, give people what they want to hear. I want them to be motivated. I want them to wake up every day and have a goal. And when you're goal oriented, I think your life just runs a lot easier. So I feel like for me, fitness is a big part and I feel like I could help people, you know, get to where they want to be physically and mentally. So for me, I feel like that would be a really cool job. So, is there anything else you wanted to say or get across or let people know about? Um, I would just like to say that I'm so blessed to be in the U.S., been given this journey, you know, so I appreciate everyone's support from, you know, my family, of course, all of 5280, all of OU. You know, Vlad, Arena, Sasha, Mark, Steve, Taki, Chris, Josh, Valeria. Shout outs. Um, you know, the trainers yeah. at OU, my teachers at school, all my friends who've been there from the beginning, 
So I just want to say thank you to all of them. Yeah, and thank you to you for doing this. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Hello and welcome to Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. I'm NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn. This week we're looking at some home safety with tips and tricks for easy appliance repairs, cleaning a fireplace, and the importance of having a working carbon monoxide detector. Plus, what you need to know before renting a home share. All that and more coming up on Today All Day. A private island in Indonesia? You can rent it on Airbnb. Or how about this Irish castle, listed here on Verbo? In the month of September alone, there were nearly 5 million homes rented on just those two sites. Even Marriott, the largest hotel chain, can't ignore the trend, now offering select homes and villas for rent. One of the biggest perks of using a home share, the ability to rent something you might not otherwise get to experience. Take, for example, this beautiful home here on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts. We're in a six bedroom home. It rents for $25,000 a week, but hang on, it sleeps 14 people. So if you do the math, that actually works out to $255 per night per person, a similar price to what you pay for a comparable hotel, but you get all of this shared space in an exclusive location. And with a kitchen, you have the option to cook meals over multiple days for a big group. Those savings add up. Jeremy Gall is the CEO of Breezeway, a company that helps property managers maintain quality and safety standards for vacation rentals. What's the advantage of using a home share? Two big things. There's so much space and the property is so unique. So you get to really enjoy something that's different than when you stay in a hotel. But that difference also means you should have a safety checklist when renting a home share. When you first get to a home, what should you be looking for? Yeah, you're going to walk in, you're going to want to unpack, everybody's excited, but the first thing you should do is just orientate yourself and get aware about the property. Here's a good example. Here's where the fire extinguisher is and emergency numbers and contact information. And what about those chemicals under the sink? Don't expect there's going to be safety latches on these properties. Uh, but if you're traveling with little kids, just be aware and make sure these are all taken care of. Maybe move, take the time to move them up. In a home, pay particular attention to the smoke detector outside the kitchen. Prior guests might have cooked something smoky and pulled the batteries. When renting an entire home, consider the unfamiliar features, especially at night. The number one accident at vacation homes is trip and fall hazards. This property has a nightlight, but it's always a good idea to bring one with you. I love this room. I see it has a bunk bed. A lot of home shares have bunk beds. What are the safety tips around bunk beds? Popular option, kids under six shouldn't be in the top bunk. So this is something a lot of people might not have in their own home, a huge balcony like this with this kind of view. Yeah, amazing. If you have a balcony like this, you want to look at three things, the height, the stability and the gaps in between the balusters to make sure it's not too wide. Yeah, good idea if you have kids and also pets. Yeah, pets is a really good point. Pools can be fun, but a lot of times the pools don't have any kind of fencing around them. No, this is wide open and there's really easy access. So a couple things to keep in mind. One, if you're traveling in a group, designate one adult who's going to be in charge of pool safety. Okay. The other thing to do is check with the manager, make sure you understand how the pool cover works so you can open and close it and keep it closed when you're not using it. Some simple tips so you can safely enjoy your time in a home away from home. So it's just something to be aware of. Like I said, some people love it, some people don't. We use it a lot, mm -hmm. just frankly, Same. because then we have a whole house, we have a kitchen, I don't have to worry about somebody coming in. Anyway, but you, there are some horror stories that people say where they feel like they've been watched or videos. So what do we need to know to protect ourselves? Yeah, that's a big one. Spy cams can yes. be an issue. It's been in the headlines. Think about it. They are so easy to hide. This right here is a spy cam. Wait, that right is there box? in wow. this tissue box. Yeah, there you go. And oh, I'm that's actually, creepy. I can watch you live in real is time. It's Elsa's eye. It's Elsa's eye. Right eye. Wow. Yeah. Oh, oh. There you Let are. it go. Let it go. That is. <laughs> Let it go. Yeah. It's creepy, but it's kind of cool. It is super cool. Wait, that right? is crazy. I mean, not for you know, you know what I mean. But like if you're looking at, you know. what else? Are those uh -huh. cameras? Technologically, too? it's cool. Yes, Dylan. Where that is a smoke detector, an alarm clock. Those are both cameras. So these things are getting sneakier and sneakier, easier to hide. Is it a camera? Yep. But is it for the homeowner to make sure their house isn't being used in a way? That's true. Like, you know, if it's just 
big parties for, you know, underage kids? If or? that's the case, then you have to disclose it. Most mm -hmm. of these rental sites make you say, hey, there's a camera in the front right. door. There's a camera in the living room. They shouldn't be in the bathroom, the bedroom, and that's why you need to check for things that are suspicious, like something plugged in an outlet in a bathroom or smoke detector over the toilet or the mm -hmm. shower. Oh, well, What's now, it doing well, there? Yeah, that's, hey, now. that's a problem. Right? <laughs> what if you get there and, you know, you saw this, these great pictures on the website, and then you get there and it's like, this looks nothing like what I, I pay, paid for. Big problem. First thing, call the person that you're renting from. Try to negotiate that refund. If not, bypass them. Head straight to the website. But really, the most important thing, be proactive about it. Check to see if there's reviews. If there aren't very many, that's a red flag. Do a Google Street View. Enter the address. That's if amazing. the exterior doesn't yeah. match what you're seeing in real time, mm -hmm. that's a big red flag. Vicky Wynn, you always make us a little one. smarter. And I, you, when you said the Street View thing, I've been doing that too. from now on. It's a really yeah. good tip. And yeah. Craig wants to know, can you have the uh, Elsa box? <laughs> this, is, this is next That's level. Really cool. It's all yours, Craig. Look How much eyes. does something like this cost? What is that? <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm going to get in. I'll check in on that and get back to okay. you. We'll we can get right a little back. custom. Maybe we'll do a Minions cool. one for Ooh, you. Craig. Craig's got a pants can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back, hopefully. Welcome back to the third hour of today. Actress and comedian Anna Faris had quite the scare last week. Uh -huh. During what was supposed to be a fun family Thanksgiving at a rental home, it quickly turned into a potentially deadly situation. Uh, she writes on Twitter, I'm not quite sure how to express gratitude to the North Lake Tahoe Fire Department who were saved from carbon monoxide. It's a stupidly dramatic story, but I'm feeling very fortunate. What happened? Well, so, first of all, we have Vicki. That's right. Our investigate NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn to talk more about this. Good Vicky. morning. Yeah, this is a scary one, especially this time of year. We're inside more. The windows are closed. And this really could happen to anyone at your home or even when you're on vacation. So that's when you're vulnerable. What happened? So essentially, people in her group started to feel sick. A couple of them actually went to the hospital. They thought, oh, we're in Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not used to the altitude. Turns out they were suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. The emergency responders went back to the house, treated two more people at this Lake Tahoe rental. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. You saw the picture on Twitter. But maybe was sealed, didn't have a carbon monoxide alarm. Mm -hmm. Firefighters haven't said what the source of the carbon monoxide gas was, but they did say it was CO poisoning. Mm -hmm. And had they all just said, oh, you know what, we're going to sleep this off, mm -hmm. that could have been a deadly why situation. Why didn't they s just sleep it off? Why did, why did their symptoms, get, or how did their symptoms get bad enough that they decided they needed to call for help? Well, the symptoms are headache, dizziness, um, nausea. So they felt so mm, bad. They scary, felt like they yeah. had to go to the hospital, which mm. is good that they didn't lie down and just say, oh, yeah. it's nothing. I'll just so get over it. would just lie down. A lot of people and, would. Yeah, and absolutely. the results could have been a lot different. In fact, Anna's dad, Jack, in the North Tahoe Fire Public Information had a lot to say about the scare. Mm. Take a look. We are grateful to be alive. We thought we just had uh, the effects of being at high altitude, and it turned out that that was not the case. Had they just gone to sleep and hoped that they felt better in the morning, none of them would have woken up. Oh my gosh, yeah. that yeah. is so scary. Strong what words, are, what are true. Folks, folks who are watching or listening, some things that they can do to make sure that this is not something that happens to them. Mm. Really important to just check on any gas-powered uh, appliances in your house, mm -hmm. whether that's your gas stove or your range. You don't want Generators. to be using your generator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You don't want to be using those without proper ventilation. This is another thing people do this time of year. You want to get in your car, warm it up before you head out. It's winter. Get that garage door open. Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide gas builds up mm -hmm. so quickly. And Dylan, I think you were talking about apartments, right? Like, can right, you still? Right. I, I feel like a lot of I'm people not sure if apartment. I have one, but I live in an apartment. I don't have a, a car connected to the the house or anything. So, is it a threat for people who live in an apartment too? It can be. Sometimes people use those space heaters to warm up oh, a yeah. small sure. space. If that is a gas fueled um, right. space heater, yeah. then that can be an issue. Mm -hmm. Basically, carbon monoxide is produced anytime you burn a fuel, and this is the number one thing. Right, yes, the carbon monoxide alarm. You can get this for under $30, $20, really, at any big box retailer. Mm -hmm. We picked one up at Dwayne Reed. Fire departments this time of year are also giving these things away free. So check with your yeah. local fire department if it's not something you can buy. And by the way, there is a, 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 an expiration on these. Mm -hmm. Generally, five years is the, is the efficacy of it, and then you have to replace them. That's a really good point, Alan. Also, check the batteries. Yeah. Twice a year, daylight savings, that's a good time to go for the smoke alarms and the carbon monoxide Thank alarms. You Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. I'm glad you talked about this. And yeah, we'll yeah. be right back. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. Oh, 
I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Okay, so get ready to take notes. Lifestyle expert Jill Bauer has a list of must-haves to make sure you and your family are prepared in an unexpected emergency. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, ladies. Nice to see you. Okay, you're going to show us what we need in our home and in our cars, right? Right, because you know, this is the time of year when people are making resolutions and they're thinking about ways to get organized. Well, part of that should be, is my family prepared in case something should happen? So let's take a look at what you need the next time you're out on the road. So here are the things that are important to keep in the front area of your car. In your center console, you wanna make sure you have a tool like this. This is designed to cut through your seat belt in case you can't unbuckle, as well as break through glass if you're trapped. And then in your glove box, a couple other things you should have on hand. Make sure that you have a small first aid kit. Make sure you have an additional phone charger with a cable and make sure that that's charged. And also make sure you have a small hand crank flashlight. You also need to have some key things in the back of your car, so let me show you what those are. I like to keep the back of my car organized with a duffel bag like this one and here are the essentials I always have on hand. Start out with my jumper cables, an extra blanket, a comprehensive first aid kit, a couple of different kinds of lights are important so an all-weather flashlight make sure that you've checked those batteries but also an emergency light like this that lets other cars see you in the dark. Those are great because they're magnetic. These emergency thermal blankets and rain ponchos, you can usually find those at outdoor stores. They don't take up a lot of room, but they're really great in case you need them. A pair of gloves, some duct tape, and then don't forget about some extra snacks and a bottle of water. And if you happen to travel with your pets, make sure you include some dog treats too. Oh, Jill, I love it. You know it all. That was awesome information. Now you've taken us inside the home where you're going to get to everything we need, starting with fire safety. Yeah. And this is so important, everybody, because I know you probably have on your radar, let's make sure we check our batteries and our smoke detectors. But here's what a lot of people don't know. The detector themselves, the unit, only has a 10-year shelf life. Oh. So if you've lived in the same house for 15 years and all you're doing is continually charging the batteries, you could still have a faulty unit. So make sure you're charging or you're replacing the unit every 10 years and the batteries regularly. Same with carbon monoxide detectors. Those should be located on all levels of your home. And then in case you should need to put out a small fire, make sure you have fire extinguishers. They have fire extinguishers now for specific areas of the home. So that also makes them a little bit lighter and easier to manage, especially one you might want to keep under the sink in your kitchen. I like to write the date on those extinguishers so that you know when you put it in. Most of these have a kind of shelf life of six to 12 years. And finally, if you live on a or live in a home that's multi-level, you want to make sure that you do have a fire escape ladder. That fire escape ladder is something you should practice with, not going out and climbing down it, but making sure that it fits the window properly so that in the event you would need to use it, you know that it's going to work the way that it should. By the way, the smoke detector, carbon monoxide, and fire extinguishers are also great for people who live in apartments or condos, not just homeowners. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we're moving now, let's move to, by the way, I'm like taking notes on all these things, a ladder, who would have thought? All right, so <laughs> when a storm hits, often you lose electricity and you feel like, uh oh, what am I going to do? Most of us have a flashlight. What else should you have? So these are basics, Hoda, you know, have a stockpile of extra batteries, make sure you have some different types of lanterns and lamps. I like flameless candles, 
But check out this cool new innovative flashlight from GE. This is a regular flashlight that you're, or excuse flashlight. me, light bulb that you're going to put inside of your lamp, and you're going to use it like you use normal light bulbs. However, when the power goes out, it stays on, what? and you can even unscrew it from your lamp, turn it on, and use it as wow. a handheld flashlight that gets a five-hour charge. They're LED bulbs, so they last for hundreds of hours of light. It's a really cool concept, and I think it's great peace of mind. Yeah, that really is. I feel like we should all have at least one of those. Let's talk about drinking water if it becomes compromised. Yeah, so you can, you know, for kind of personal emergency things, you want to make sure that you have an all-weather radio, have a whistle so that you can let people know where you are, have a backup supply of drinking water, but then use something called a life straw. Again, these are things that you'll find at a lot of outdoor um, kind of adventure places. They need them for survival. They're great survival for your home, too. All right, if you want to keep your valuables safe, your clothes safe, what's a way to do that? I love the idea of a dry bag pre-pack it so that you have a change of clothes in here, but also think of things like an extra bottle of prescription medication, oh. maybe an extra pair of prescription eyeglasses, things that are safe, ready to grab. Do one of these for each member of your family, and it's great yeah. to complement that with a full medical kit as well. That's another great place to keep those extra prescriptions. Yeah. Oh, Jill, yeah. thank you. If we missed <laughs> anything here, it is all on our website at hodaandjenna.com. It has been a long year. Yeah, where it's been anything but normal. Well, now there's hope. The COVID vaccines. I know, I know. It's been a little confusing. Like, really confusing. So it's more important than ever to make a plan. Visit planyourvaccine.com to find out where and when to get your vaccine. What are you waiting for? Roll up your sleeves and plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. Plan your vaccine. watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. in the world. With more of us spending a lot of time at home, uh, there's been added wear and tear on our appliances. If you need repairs, don't expect a quick fix. Vicki wins here with the latest on that. Vic. Hey, Al, it is so good to see you in person, by the way. Well, the requests for, requ for repairs are really coming in fast and furious across the country with backlogs for service calls at companies big and small. This morning, how you can make do while you wait and what you can do now, especially with the holidays right here, to check on your appliances before they stop working. Kylie Smith from New Jersey says when her refrigerator broke in early October, it was typical 2020. We noticed that our freezer wasn't freezing anymore. Once this happened, we said, of course, this is going to happen. <laughs> how are you managing then? We do have a second fridge out in the garage, but right now it's it's filled to the brim. We have three growing boys, so we need the space. She says it'll be about a month until she can get her fridge repaired. And that's figuring that when they come out, it's an immediate fix. Smith is feeling a pain point shared by thousands of people across the country. A recent survey found appliance repair calls are up 39% since the pandemic started. With a lot of us working and learning from home, many of us are using our appliances a lot more often. From the oven to the fridge. 
Consider this fun fact. Before the pandemic, we were opening our fridges about 30 times a day. Since the pandemic, that number has jumped to 130 times a day. Industry experts say there's a shortage of new appliances and people want to save money. So many would rather repair than replace. Business has been uh, amazing. It's really grown over the last uh, several months. Daniel Pigeon is the CEO of Sears Home Services. How busy are your repair technicians right now? Right now, we have a shortfall of a thousand technicians that we have that we're hiring. It really is uh, something unprecedented. Heather Dyer Yoder runs Dyer Repair Academy in Richland Hills, Texas. She says people who've lost jobs in retail and restaurants are now taking her two week long course to become certified appliance repair techs. Her classes are maxed out through January. I have employers calling me weekly do you have somebody i can hire all over the country all of my students get jobs all of them get hired before they leave dyer says to avoid breakdowns check on your appliance health look for your manual or check online for how to clean your fridge oven washer and dryer fridge coils and dryer vents are some common culprits that get clogged and make the machines work harder if a repair tech is coming to your home make sure they're wearing a mask and maintain your distance and keep your windows open for better air circulation while they're inside if you're in the market for a new appliance, go back to the basics because high-tech appliances contain specialized parts that can be harder to find and replace. Find something with less bells and whistles, less Wi-Fi, less computer chips because those are the things that are breaking and those are the things delaying you're getting your refrigerator back working. Some tips to make sure an appliance breakdown doesn't leave a wrench in your upcoming holiday plans. And good news for Kylie, her refrigerator has been repaired. Another tip, consider buying a home warranty, even if you've already been in your home for years. Just read the fine print to make sure it covers your major appliances. And what's also great about this, when you're under a home warranty, experts say you might get priority when you need a repair. Oh. Yeah. All right. Oh, so, so if you're looking for a good technician, because that's really the key, sure. how do you find one? First thing, ask friends and family for their referrals. They may have had a great experience with somebody. Then you really want to uh, check the reviews, make sure that they have good certifications. Get multiple quotes so that the price is right for you. And then also um, ask about their warranties. After they're done making that fix, how long is it good for in case they need to come back? And what if something is broken and you just need it fixed? Like going into Thanksgiving and your dishwasher is broken, what can people do? YouTube is a great way to check and see a DIY uh, repair situation. And also, you just want to call the local repair store. Maybe they'll give you some free advice. Listen, I've got this. I need this part. What can I do? Sometimes they'll help you out. Yeah. I, use, I use YouTube to clear the drain on my dishwasher. Really? Yeah. It does work. There's so many wow. great videos out there. All right. Vicki Wynn, it's always great to see you. Thanks so much. Each year, there are an estimated 20,000 fires across the country caused by chimneys and fireplaces. Investigators say the cause of the fire here on Bramer Circle was traced to a malfunctioning fireplace. The fire chief tells us the fire started in a chimney around 2.30 this morning. Even this historic mansion in Massachusetts burned to the ground last winter. The home had stood for over 100 years. It took just hours to be destroyed. This one in upstate New York making headlines because it's the home of celebrity chef Rachel Ray. Heavy smoke and fire coming from the roof of the residence near the chimney. Fire officials believe the August 9th blaze ignited in the chimney. So what should you do to safely enjoy this before you light this? We asked the expert, Mike Segerstrom from Bridgewater Chimney Sweeps is an instructor with the Chimney Safety Institute of America with 23 years of experience. Mike, what's the very first thing you should do before you light your fireplace for the season? First thing you want to do is make sure you have the fireplace inspected before use by a certified chimney sweep. That's you. Have at it. Okay. He begins with a visual inspection, checking the interior from below, then examining the exterior of the chimney from the ground and the roof, even using a high-tech camera to get a better look inside. According to the National Fire Protection Association, you need to get your chimney inspected every year because over time, chimneys collect what's called creosote, which can overheat and catch fire. Often, that's what causes chimney fires. Mike, what's the verdict on this fireplace and the chimney? So this fireplace is not in need of sweeping at this time. It is ready for the season. If it did need to be swept, what are some of the steps? What happens? The biggest component is we'll brush the entire system out internally. Once the chimney and the fireplace have been clean, what's the next step? Making sure that we're burning good wood in the fireplace. It should be stored outside 
for at least a year. That way you can guarantee that it's not going to produce extra amounts of soot or creosote. Before you enjoy your fireplace, make sure there's nothing flammable within four feet and always have a screen to capture any sparks that could fly into your home. Mike says the most common mistake, people forgetting to open their flu damper. The first sign of someone not opening the flu damper is the smoke immediately comes back into the home. The best way to put out the fire is to simply let it burn out on its own and never use water to extinguish the flames. It's going to cause the wood to sp possibly spark uh, and water in a hot fireplace could actually damage some of the masonry. If it's an emergency, make sure you have a fire extinguisher nearby and you know how to use it. Simple reminders to enjoy your fireplace safely. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. There you go. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Now with Nest Cam, these guys can check in 24 seven. Hey, you little thief. The commercials are everywhere. So you can get an alert if someone's there who shouldn't be. Or the latest in smart home school. technology from companies like Nest and Ring, Stop. allowing you to see what's happening in and around your house and protect it in real time. But what happens when the bad guys turn that technology against you? Across the country, hackers have gained access to those cameras and harassed families in their homes. In Seattle, in Florida, I'll leave you and your family alone, or I could do this. And in Mississippi, an eight-year-old girl terrorized. Who is that? I'm your best friend. You can do whatever you want right now. You can mess up your room. You can break your TV. So how easy is it for someone to hack into your home security system? To find out more, I'm here with Mark Spoonauer. He's the editor-in-chief of Tom's Guide. It's an online tech magazine. So tell me about this. How common of a problem is this, and how easy is it for hackers? So first things first is that it's not that common for devices like this to be hacked. But if it happens to you, it's really scary. He says the devices themselves are secure, but warns that hackers can break in using compromised credentials. And they usually come in through usernames and passwords that are out there on the dark web. Tom's Guide security editor Paul Wagonseal is in another room logging into this Nest camera to show you how easily it can happen. Hey guys, I'm logged in and I can hear you and I can see you. That is very creepy. That is not supposed to be happening with a security camera. No, it's not. And the reason why he's be able to get in is because he has access not to the device itself necessarily. It's because he's able to log in with our username and password, which could be freely available on the web, especially if you've been part of a data breach. How do you know if you've been part of a data breach? You can search online at haveibeenpwned.com. Just plug in your username. If it comes up red, it's time for a new one. And when creating a password, remember that it should be long, unique, and strong. But Spoon Hour says the most important thing to do, use two-factor authentication. When a hacker tries to get in, you will get sent a text message to your phone because they're not on a approved network, right? And that unique code that's sent to your phone via text allows you to grant access or not to whoever is trying to get into your system. So it alerts you before anyone can get in. That's right. It's a basically a gatekeeper. Wagon Seal tries to log in again, but this time there's two-factor authentication. There it is. 
So we have a text message that just came in. Okay, what does that mean? So this is our authentication code, right? So if we wanted to get in right now to log into our system and see the footage on this camera, we would have to not only enter our username and password, but this very unique code. And you can see that it changes every time. Uh So only the person who has the phone that's associated with the account can get in. Good advice to make sure this doesn't happen to you. I'm your best friend. A few more tips. Don't forget about your router. That's the hub of your home. Make sure you're not using the default password that it came with. If you don't change that, the bad guys can easily use it to get into your smart home if they find your Wi-Fi network, and that would affect anything that's connected to your Wi-Fi. Now, these same security measures also apply to smart toys that connect to the Internet. If they have a camera or a microphone, hackers can get into those toys. So choose passwords that are unique, long, and different across your device. These are places we may not be able to visit for a while. Come with us as we take you there, into our incredible world. Ah, Italy. Where to begin in this land of Romans, Renaissance and Romance? How about the place where quarantine was invented 600 years ago? If you're going to lock down, where better than in the most beautiful city in the world? Venice. A labyrinth of winding canals famed for its glorious art and architecture. The birthplace of a billion romances. Casanova once lived here. George Clooney got married here. And so did American Marie Ohanassian, who met her gondolier husband, Roberto, in Venice. I'll give you a year, 1985, and got married two years later. I was here on vacation. 30 years of marriage, my friend. Yeah, it'll be 31. 31, yes. How's it going? Um, I'm a lucky guy, huh? (laughs) There is a famous Venetian tradition that says, if you kiss while passing under a bridge, you and your lover remain in love forever. In recent years, Venice discovered that its beauty can be a double-edged sword. The people who truly love it lost in a sea of selfie-taking tourists. We all got the selfie we can leave now, but you don't even realize where you are. So Venice needs to be understood and needs to be savored. You live in history. Francesco da Mosta, whose family has lived in this Venetian house for generations, agrees. Venice doesn't need so much tourism. So much tourism is destroying Venice. When you lose the soul of a place, then it's lost. Then, for almost every one of us, everything changed. In Venice, it meant overnight the visitors vanished. As the world turned upside down, The pollution here disappeared. The water never looked clearer. More than ever, you could see why the Italians call this city on the sea La Serenissima, the most serene. Amazing, really, when you think that this was once a bustling metropolis, the trading center of the world. And by truly exploring this enchanted city, you can find that history around every corner. The family that lived here at the Palazzo Pisani were modern day billionaires, merchants of Venice. Hello. (laughs) Now it's cared for by Giovanni Gio. I can't believe this was someone's home. Of course, of course it was, absolutely. It's been a home of the Pisani family for over Four centuries. Imagine the history this home has seen, the highs and lows, and survived it all, just about. 200 rooms and 400 windows. <laughs> I know that we have to fix it every year. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of windows to repair. Within the walls of the palazzo, there's a trail of secrets. There are Masonic symbols everywhere. There are many and many secret passages everywhere. This palazzo is full of hidden staircases which goes up and down. This way, it takes exactly to the Mason temple. This is the Sala d'Oro, the golden room. And once it was totally covered with gold. As you can see on the wall, there's a little trace of the gold. Wow, and on the ceiling. And on the ceiling, of course, yes. The family fortune 
lost in gambling debts. This building is now a music centre. For this grand house, just another chapter in its long history. Perhaps that's the story of Venice. It has endured, like its grandest gondolas, these elaborately detailed boats hidden away for most of the year. They are relics of the past, but in Venice, gondolas are still transporting people around this floating citadel, as they have done for a thousand years. And maybe there's something about that history that might help us in these times of trouble. Across the country, another spot famous for its history, Florence. Back when travel was so easy, we took time to take in its domed cathedral, walk its cobbled streets and cross its enchanting bridges. A place for meditation and, as any Tuscan will tell you, a place to have fun. Hey, hey! How's it going, buddy? Welcome to Florence. My friend and colleague Claudio, who's as Italian as Armani, introduced me to the local cocktails. What are we going to drink? We're going to have an apple, well, a spritz, mm -hmm. which is half prosecco, okay. which is Italian champagne, and then you can put two things in it: either aperol or mm -hmm. Campari. A little taste test. Yes. Okay. Salute. 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 Remember when you could share drinks without disinfecting the glass? I feel like we should hold hands. No. <laughs> Within Florence's medieval walls lived many celebrated characters of the Renaissance. Who has walked on these streets? Michelangelo. Galileo. Galileo. Da Vinci. Da Vinci. And now us. <laughs> what a fall from grace. <laughs> Let's get back to some historic drinking. Why not? <laughs> this is a 17th century statue of a wild boar. Yeah. And right. if you catch the nose, yes. it will bring you good luck. Okay. I'll give you a coin, put the coin in the mouth, okay. let it drop. Ah, uh, no luck. <laughs> what no, because happened? it needs to go through the grate. Oh, yes! Yes! <laughs> yes! Yeah, I Avere più ghiaccio. Can oh. I have more ice in my drink? That's it. We should eat something, right? Yeah. Florence's answer to the hot dog. This is for you. Is that for me? All right. Yeah. Wow. So... Oh, you're eating it too? Well, well that's reassuring. You know. Have a go. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So, what is um, it? What is it? It's meat. This is um, called Lampredotto. Lampredotto, okay. It's the lining of a cow's stomach. It's kind of tripe, but worse. <laughs> That's what I just ate. I need to drink to forget. Mm. Now this is what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Hi, good morning. Hello, welcome. Hi, welcome. Nice to meet you. We're going to start with uh, Chianti Classico. So this is Classico. Chianti Classico. Exactly. Okay. From uh, Castellina and Chianti. It's right. a very small producer. Uh, it's been in the same family for three generations. Mm. Like in Italy, it's not just about drinking. The wine is really a family tradition. My father used to make wine right. for the family. My daughter's call wine daddy water. <laughs> <laughs> Salute. 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 Cheers. Bye. There's one more drink I need to try. This is called the Negroni. Okay. Very famous in Italy. It was invented in Florence. Yes. It's called the Negroni because it was invented by a count. Wow. Called a count. Camillo Negroni. Yes. How does it taste? It's pretty really good. I like it. I like it. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I love you. You're the best. <laughs> no, you're the best. When you wanna... After all that excitement, it's time to slow down. Italy. That means heading south. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines. So crucial for reopening America. A big day around here. A very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Ready to go. 
spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Uh, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it! I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. In the region of Campania, high on a hilltop, is this picturesque Italian town of old houses and narrow streets. Oh, oh very narrow streets. We've traveled to sun-bleached southern Italy, where the pace of life is slower. In this typical Italian town, the locals are, well... Buongiorno. Um, hi, how are you? Buongiorno, buonasera. <laughs> Wait, you're not Italian. No, I'm not Italian. <laughs> Just like you. Ciao. Ciao. Where are you from? I'm from Los Angeles, California. Uh, we're from Santa Barbara. Please, will someone explain? Ciao. Hi, <laughs> Carlo? Yes. Carlo from California has emigrated to Guardia San Fernandi, a town founded before Columbus found America. We're kind of right in the middle of the whole Italy thing. The Italy thing? The Italy thing. What do you love about the Italy thing? Uh. It's kind of like I've been dropped in an alternative universe where people are still really nice to each other. Ciao. 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 This old-fashioned place where folks say hello, or ciao, was slowly consigned to the past. But now, more than 100 Americans and others have bought property in Guardia. Kind of a little America. Piccolo Americano, they call it. Ciao. Ciao. Glenn is still refurbishing, but plans to keep some of the old features. Love the old life, yeah. His house, once home to a wealthy Italian Contessa. This was the Contessa's bedroom. Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Admittedly, you can get a little carried away. You don't have to be Shakespearean aristocracy to live here, says restoration expert Benny Adamo. For $15,000, you can have this view. Or if you have a spare $170,000, this 18th century palazzo is yours. Frescoes. Yeah, frescoes. Look at that. OK, it's a bit of a doer-upper. Look, is, is the bed included? Yeah, the bed is included. You can take whatever you want. When you buy these houses, you buy a piece of their history, too. <laughs> Rooms untouched. 1784. A journal written before George Washington became president. Incredible. You need a room with a view. <laughs> Carlo, whose house is above a waterfall, says nothing happens fast here. I got the formula down. It's <laughs> three times as long, six times as many people. <laughs> Except, of course, the Italian take on fast food. So this is not your home delivery pizza. <laughs> <laughs> the pizza, invented in this region, is eaten fresh from the oven. Wow. The coffee is drunk in a single hit. Not bad. It's good though, right? It's good. It's good. <laughs> Ciao. Maria San Fromondi is a little less quiet now. With all these new neighbors. And even more friendly. So, this is what it's all about, guys. Right? La Dolce Vita. The further south you go, 
the slower life gets. Until you reach the very tip of Italy and the ancient and beautiful Mediterranean island of Sicily. Humans have called this place home since 12,000 BC, which is a lot of time to learn how to cook and make great coffee. Some brought those twin passions to America, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren returning to Sicily, looking not for their future, but for their past. And I really don't think you really know who you are unless you know where you came from. Steve Balistreri and his dad have come in search of their ancestors. First stop, the fishing village of Termine Imereze. For hundreds of years, the Balistreris made their living from the sea. The economy really went bad during the 1870s and 1880s. Expert ancestry genealogist George Ott, who has joined us for this journey, has researched the Balistreri family history. This is the church your ancestors had their sacraments in. Taking Steve and his dad to the places where generations of Balistreris were born. I think how many of our relatives have been baptized right here. Grew up. So this is where they lived. This is the little street they played on. And died. It's so good to see uh, my Aunt Rosemary here. In a cafe, there's a chance to grab an espresso. What are you doing? They are from Milwaukee. <laughs> Before the tour continues to the records office. In these old documents, stories of determination, resilience, and the strength of the human spirit. These are the signature of Maria Gagliotto and your grandfather, Salvatore Baristre. That's amazing. It's like this was yesterday. It was Steve's great-grandfather, Salvatore, who was the first balustrari to make it to America. But his wife did not. On the boat over to America, uh, Maria died. They gave up a lot. She gave up her life. Overcoming impossible odds, tragedy and hardship, there are lessons for us all from the folks who came before us. Like Salvatore, who from a humble grocery cart grew a hugely successful family business in America. This is your history right here. That's right. Uh, my great grandfather would go through the streets yelling, ah, tomatoes, cantaloupes, or whatever. Can you still spot a good orange? I could do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Time for lunch. This famous fish restaurant Buongiorno. is special. Owner Francesco and his brother are balustreries too. Today, the two families meet for the first time. I love the balustrade in the world. Francesco preparing a feast in their honor with other members of the balustrari clan, old and young, all recorded here in the family tree. What it comes down to is, okay, everybody's interrelated after so many years. They're a very friendly group. <laughs> I wish I was Sicilian. <laughs> Salute. 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 So many memories to take home. Bonds once broken. Now a family found across the ocean. This is what life is about. And what so much of Italy is about with its rich history. One day, our lives will be history too. But the magic of Italy, its culture, its beauty, and the way it just makes your heart sing will always be with us. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Future's looking yeah. bright. 
Are you ready? We're going to do our part to spread the word on the importance of vaccines, so crucial for reopening America. A big day around here, a very special naturalization ceremony. Many of them doctors, nurses, other essential workers. If you are a nurse, thank you. Spring has sprung, guys, and we want to fill this season with some fun and surprises. Yes, this is the face of excitement. Ah, celebrating Earth Day. Let's change the world. Love it. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Let's go. And good evening from New Orleans. There is breaking news. There you go. NBC News than any other news organization in the world. These are places we may not be able to visit for a while. Come with us as we take you there into our incredible world. South Korea assaults the senses with sights and sounds. It can be overwhelming. High rise, high tech, but with a flip side that has its roots in a more tranquil, ancient age. South Korea has roots going back thousands of years, back to what many believe was a more enlightened time. Hi, Keith. Hi, Keir. Travel writer Keith Giopo moved to Seoul from New York seven years ago. He takes me into this ancient palace in the heart of Seoul. In the 60s and 70s, the old generation, they knocked everything down to make way for modernization. But now people are starting to realize how precious it is. It's 5,000 years old. This is a part of our DNA. And today, younger Koreans are rediscovering their rich heritage from the fashion for wearing traditional costumes to learning centuries-old calligraphy. And this ancient martial art called takyeon, also known as dancing with kicks. It perhaps inspired modern taekwondo, South Korea's national sport. Then there is this, a 2,000-year-old tea ceremony. Here, we just kind of relax and enjoy every little pour. So when you, when you take the cup, mm -hmm. make, make sure you take it with two hands, you bring it up to your, to your nose, get a fragrance of it. And when you drink it, make sure you drink it all in three sips. It's all about harmony, isn't it? Yeah, balance and harmony. Yin and yang. And if the tea ceremony can be thought of as yin, then this is yang. One of the most advanced tech nations on the planet, South Korea is often home to the very latest gadgetry. <laughs> Virtual reality, face recognition technology. There I am. Smart homes. Now that's grocery shopping. And even smarter robots. Have a nice trip. At the airport, you might be greeted by one of these robot guides. There are robot fish, and these droids are skiing. Sort of. Now all these guys are kind of cute, but then there's this. Meet Method 2, 13 feet tall, weighing in at one and a half tons, and yours for eight and a half million dollars. He's powerful. So powerful that for safety, scientists had to limit his strength. If the robot is much stronger than humans, people feel threatened. It's the creation of Yang Jinho, who dreamt about building robots as a kid. And today, a hundred million dollars later, that dream came true. We wanted to make a tool that helps humans. 
go into hazardous environments like nuclear disaster zones. This metal giant, wish me luck, is also <laughs> the world's first manned bipedal robot. That means okay. you can drive it. Right now, there are limitations with robot technology. Method 2 is still taking baby steps, tethered to safety. A future dominated by robots may be a long way off, but one day, we'll be meeting a lot more of these marvelous metal machines. Up next, I travel to the southernmost tip of the country and get a lesson hunting for seafood with the Henyu, the incredible women freedivers of South Korea. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. And good evening from New Orleans, there is breaking news. I'm rolling up my sleeves for science, so I'll survive if I contract this virus. For family dinners, family vacations, family anything. For traveling somewhere beyond my living room. And for the Rebels, there is no greater feeling than being in the stadium and cheering on Ole Miss. And now it's your turn. Roll up your sleeves, America. Plan your vaccine, because every shot counts. Visit planyourvaccine.com and make your plan. More Americans watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. watch NBC News than any other news organization in the world. Now we are traveling to the southernmost tip of South Korea, to the remote and tiny island of Murada. Because of its ragged coastline, surrounded by treacherous seas, it was once known as the Forbidden Island. Today, it is home to a hundred people. <laughs> Among them, this extraordinary group of women. Hey, hey. They call themselves the Henyu. And they follow a tradition that goes back hundreds of years. Henyo. At 41, Kim Che Young is the youngest Henyo on the island. All year round, she, her mother, and aunt dive together in these treacherous waters. The Henyo, or women of the sea, are modern day mermaids. Without air tanks, holding their breath for up to two minutes at a time, these women collect seaweed, shellfish, and octopus from the seabed. How dangerous is it? If you're thinking other things, it's really dangerous. Last year, one woman was swept away. Is there a risk from sharks? Yes, a lot. A lot of sharks. With a handful of seaweed, Kim demonstrates how to keep the mask from fogging and the whistling technique that helps the Henyo control their breathing. Few get the chance to dive with the Henyo. To start with, I wasn't very good. With a little help from my friends, I began to get the hang of it. I just, don't oh. <laughs> bud. Just what I was thinking, he's got more. <laughs> keep working, keep she said. Working. Stop <laughs> talking, keep working. This is a tough living. The women have a saying. One breath, one shellfish. I want people to know about Henyo. Photographer Wai Zin, who introduced us to the island, first encountered the Henyo a few years back. When I met them, they are look really 
strong and really look really happy. But back then, she says, these amazing women had no idea what people thought about them. Mama Henya told me she didn't know how, how much she'd be proud. She, she didn't, didn't know, know she could be proud of herself? Yes. Until you came along? Yes. <laughs> Waisin has been documenting the Henyo and their proud tradition in a book of extraordinary photographs. She's 94. 94. This is Kim's grandmother. After 80 years, she still dives almost every day. And as night falls, it's time to cook up the catch. Is this the octopus that you caught today? We saw you grabbing it out of the rock. If you do all the work, all day. What do the men do? Nothing. They do nothing. They the just waiting, nothing. waiting the lunch. Waiting for their lunch. <laughs> the words of the song are, why was I born? The life of a henyo is so hard and the water is so cold. To the henyo. Henyo! Morikawa, and um, let's go back to last summer because roughly this time last summer, you're 23 years old. Um, here we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, here you are, brand new on the tour, and you go out and you win the PGA Championship. What was